Well, well, I mean, I'm a Bears fan, so my view of the Patriots is from 1985. <coughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 12 of the Digital to Dice podcast. I am Dave. Ron is on assignment, as they say. He will not be joining us today, but who will be joining me is the editor-in-chief of Sports Sim Magazine, S.T. Patrick. He will come on our show today. We talk about what he's playing, as well as episode one of his brand new magazine, and that is the Sports Sim Magazine. So sit back and enjoy episode 12 of Digital to Dice. Joining us on the Dice Line today, we have S.T. Patrick. He is the editor-in-chief of the Sports Sim Magazine. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, Dave. I've actually heard every episode so far. It's a great job that you and Ron do. Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, th- thank you so much. We had no idea when we started this thing what was going to happen, but we've been uh, <laughs> warmly received and warmly welcomed by the community, and um, we're really enjoying uh, at- adding this podcast to the community. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, hey, we usually get it right into the interview, but let's do something different with you. Let's ask you what you're playing. Okay, well, right now I'm going through um, a, f- a few projects because, as you might I'm, well, I'm sure as a lot of guys are out there, you know, I'm very OCD in this game world. Um, it's hard for me to stick with one thing at one time for a long time. Um, I am playing an NFL season, but it's a draft league, and I'm sort of doing it by myself right now. I'm doing it solitaire, but it's a draft league starting in ni- 1974 and ending at the end of 1975, and I heard you guys sort of discuss this a few weeks ago, but um, I'm using the Dave Koch games, and it's fantastic. Um, And I wanted to draft linemen. I wanted to draft everyone on defense. I wanted uh, there to be some sort of a strategy in the draft as opposed to just... My problem with strat and my problem with strat football especially is I don't like just, for example, drafting the entire Niners defense or the entire Bears defense with one pick. That sort of throws off to me, that throws off the whole drafting strategy. If if you want to spend your first five picks on offense, I think that you should be sacrificing something on defense. I don't necessarily think that you should just in round one or two, for example, of a draft, be able to draft the entirety of half of your team, the entirety of your defense. So, yes, I I wanted to draft a punter. I wanted to draft Ray Guy or someone like that. I I, I wanted to draft a kicker. Um, so I'm doing that. And as many have said out there, you know, a lot of the fun for me is really making my draft pool and thinking about all these players once again and going through every season to see the you know all of the ratings and to say oh you know I would have thought for sure that he was more uh active more talented in this year than that year and and just seeing those 85 Bears statistics because I'm a big 85 Bears fan being an Illinoisan and and I'm sure as a Patriots guy you 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 smile as you hear that (laughs) but (laughs) um that was a pretty magical magical year for Illinoisans and for fans of the Bears especially and I'm also doing a little bit of NBA with Strat actually on the computer I play most games on on the computer let me me hold you right there on that okay so you're doing that draft league first of all what made you pick 74 75 well I'm trying to sort of split the NFL years up and I kind of don't want to throw off the statistical equilibrium of of the group of years that I choose. And there becomes a time in the very, very late 90s. What I'm probably going to do is then go from everything after 85 up through 98. And then go from 99 up to right now. So I'm probably going to split it in three like that. Mainly because as, as I look at the statistics, I want everything to sort of match. I don't want anything to be completely out of whack. And... When you right now, you could have a pretty bad quarterback on a team and he's still completing 62 to 63 percent of his passes. Um, 
1974 through around 85, that didn't happen. A very bad quarterback in that time would have completed around 45 to 48%. So I didn't want to completely throw off the statistical equilibrium is what I call it. But so that range, um, you have an era where running backs are somewhat important. You have an era where defense really does matter. And the quarterbacks, all the numbers sort of fit in one pool together, which is important. Um, Now, Dan Marino there is the outlier. Uh, that 1984 year that Dan Marino had is just amazing in, in that time period. And so he's going to be the outlier, but that's okay because he should be. And I do want that to happen because he did sort of change the game. Yep. And the other thing you brought up too was the idea that you wanted to draft everybody on the team, including all of defense individually. Uh, yes. And one, one of the things that, that, that I talk about on my little video uh, digital to dice uh, dialogue I do once in a while on YouTube and also on our, our podcast here is options. And mm-hmm. when you brought that up, the first thing that struck me was options. And it's like, boy, I tell you, some people, I don't want to say most because I don't know for sure, but I know when you're picking fantasy, you mostly go with offensive guys. That's what you key on. And then you pick a defense. You know, so yeah. so when you're doing, like you said, this project that you're doing there, I would think that most people would be keying on the individual people on offense and then just want to pick a defense. Maybe they wouldn't want to pick all individual defensive mm-hmm. linemen and linebackers. But as you said, if you know, if you have that option, and we talk options, that is fantastic mm-hmm. that you could pick yes. every single guy that you know on your team if you wanted to. And and I like the point you brought up. That why should you draft half your team in one fell swoop on one pick? Mm-hmm. Like, I have this great defense. Well, mm-hmm. no. I mean, why should you get, you know, the purple people eaters of the Minnesota Vikings up front or, yes. the, or the doomsday defense all in one swoop? You know, so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that just when you when you were talking about that, that, that made some sense. It's like, boy, you know, if you have the option of, so look, I want to pick defense in one shot or if I want to pick individuals, maybe, maybe a combination of the purple people eaters in the doomsday defense, you know, the steel right. curtain or whatever. How, how cool would that be to see, you know, one of the, the cowboys on the line with one of the Steelers with one of the Vikings? You know, that. That would be an unbelievable defensive line. Yes, yes. And that's what I kind of wanted to do was I kind of wanted there to be a a real strategy in the draft pool. I kind of wanted there to be sacrifices that had to make, which is why I always say that it's a draft pool. It's not an all-star league because one of the things, and this, this is also a whole can of worms, but one of the things that I like doing in the draft, I like bringing in a a good amount of players who sort of bottom out in those years who are not that good, whose ratings are not that good. Again, to add to the draft strategy, it's not an all-star league. I'm not going to add everybody who was talented in that era. You know, there are going to be so many great running backs that we have, but if you don't take the top five or so, you might have to deal with a guy that's averaging 3.0 yards per carry. You might have to um, draft a quarterback who's throwing f- 45%. I know you were doing the, um, I think it was the Tam- Tampa Bay Bucks, right? You know, you might have to draft a Jack Thompson. I mean, you you might not get Dan Marino from 1984, you know, but there has to be some sort of a strategy to it, which actually is is one of the faults that I find in Strat as well, which has a pretty good AI for drafting. But the thing that I find about it is it's got a pretty good AI for drafting if you want to draft against the computer, if you want to draft a really good team. What I would like to see Strat do is sort of change the AI to where uh, you can set a team to be bad, where you can set a team to have a great defense and a terrible offense. That's interesting. That, that's a good have idea. Have a team, yeah, yeah, where you can sort of custom the AI draft in Strat to where maybe they aren't just going to always draft the, you know, a need or the best possible available player in the draft pool. One of the best games I found for having a fantasy draft was uh, Franchise Hockey Manager. Okay, by mm-hmm. Out of the Park Developments. It's a hockey game. That's, that was one of the first sports sim computer games that I played. 
And I, I, I would, that was a mini game in itself for me. It was when I would fire franchise hockey manager, I would go to, I think it's called a fiction. No, no it's not fictional league. It's a fantasy. I forget what it was called, but there was some option that you could re- just clear the rosters and pick. And so you would get on a team as the general manager and you would pick. And boy, I tell you, I, I, I would spend hours every night just picking my team. And and seeing yeah, the yeah. seeing the lineup that I got, and of course you pick most of the guys that you know, in the whole bit. But I had so much fun just drafting my teams, and then I would just mm-hmm, sim mm-hmm. the season and see how it went because I I, did, I don't really know how to play that game that well. I, I don't do very well, but I would just pick my teams like wow, look at this lineup. And sometimes I would go on Facebook and I'd be like, okay, who do I take? Do I take Andy Moog? Or do I take Grant Fuhrer? Or do I take <laughs> right. Pete Peters? Who's going to be my goalie? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, and things like that. And it, when you get done, it was so fun seeing your team. And like you said, sometimes mm-hmm. you, like all the good guys were gone. You know, it's like, oh, man, okay, you know, Bork is yeah. gone. Yeah. And Gretzky's, uh, exactly. Messier, uh, Messier and Gretzky and Lemieux, all those guys are gone. So who do I take now? now? But it was fun at the end seeing your team. So there's a lot of fun to be had in a, in a fantasy draft style. Oh, right. Exactly. And in a draft league, I don't want to see parity. I don't want to see too much of it, at least. I don't want to see every team go almost 500 because it's a complete all-star league and everyone can really win on any day. Like I, I do want there to be bad teams. I do want there to be some teams that excel. Um, I can remember doing a baseball draft league from the late 90s, early 2000s, and I intentionally put... Um, Barry Bonds, Ken Griffey Jr., uh, and Derek Jeter, I think, on the same team to bat two, three, and four. But I made the starting staff, I made the starting pitching terrible for that team because I wanted to see if you could really hit your way to victory with a terrible starting staff. Oh, that's, a, that's an and, interesting idea. That's a, that's a good idea. Right, right. So I kind of like to toy with it that way. I kind of like to, uh, as I explained, you know, not always just have an all-star league. Right. Okay, so you were talking about the uh, the basketball project. That's where I, we, we yes. stopped. Mm-hmm. Okay, go ahead. Um, the basketball project has been good, too. I really like – uh, the concept of playing, you know, it's really the only sport that I haven't really done a good draft league with yet. So right now I'm sort of going with a few of the older Chicago Bulls teams, especially the teams pre-Jordan. So I'm testing out 83 and 84 to see what I can do with the Bulls. And so far, to be honest with you, it ain't much. Uh, they were not good. And and there's a reason why they had, I think, the third pick. Still hard for me to believe that Portland chose Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan. But um, but they did, and, and then changed their entire history because of it and the history of the Bulls. But And that goes um, for anybody, though. I mean, look how many people yeah, were picked yeah. ahead of Tom Brady. Who knew? Yeah. I mean, who knew? You'd never know. And, and you go back and you play the what-if game with, with, with Jordan and and. You know, practically, you know, you can name off hundreds of people that were picked and you're like, wow, how did they not go number one overall? Because you just you don't know. You don't know. Right. And you don't know to the point where those 85 Bears, even, you know, Chicagoans and Illinoisans thought the Bears were going to be back, you know, five straight years back to the Super Bowl and did not make it again for almost another 20 years. And so and I'm sure, you know. You also have teams like those 85 Patriots who were probably surprised to be there. Had you told me on on the Tuesday after the the, the very sad Monday night where the Miami Dolphins beat the Chicago Bears, their only loss of the season, had you told me that it wasn't going to be the Dolphins that we meet again, uh, I would have been very surprised. But the Patriots got hot at the right time at the end of the year. They did. I you know you know being a Boston guy. I watched all those games and I watched them. I think they went to New York and they beat the Jets. Then they went to LA and they beat the Raiders. And we were like, wow, what is going on? This is a wild card team. Then they went to Miami where they never won and they beat the Dolphins to go to the Super Bowl. And I was like, wow. And then, of course, your Bears were the team to beat that year. And, you know, the rest is history. Um, but I do, one thing I do want to add here, and we talked about this before we get on the show, is someone made a good point. 
uh, here in Boston many years ago. I think it was after the the second Super Bowl that they won here in the early 2000s. And they said, if I had told you the day after the Bears-Patriots Super Bowl that the Patriots would go back to the Super Bowl three or four times before the Bears and win two of them, would you believe me? And mm-hmm. the answer right, is right. no. We got destroyed by those Bears. And you thought those 85 Bears were going to be the, the 70 Steelers. You just thought that yeah. they were going to mow down the league and – that you know, Patriots wild card team, they were a sacrificial lamb that day. And uh, who, who would have knew that the Patriots would go back to the Super Bowl, you know, eight more times and the Bears would get there once? You know, it's crazy, right? Right, right, right. right. You, you know, and that's the good thing about gaming is is that you can do that in gaming, you can sort of make that happen. You know, part of where I started in this was because when we first got our VCR in, I think, 1984, um, a lot of people were recording HBO almost exclusively back back then. But but I was recording games. I was recording sports games. So <clears throat> what I now have is I now have external drives full of it has to be when you add up all the sports. I probably have somewhere between a thousand and two thousand games, all recorded, uh, going back to as early as 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 I can possibly find them, and have found them when the internet exploded in the late nineties. There cropped up these entire communities of people who traded games. Yeah, I I was one but of that, those guys. I I, I yeah. remember yeah. buying. VHS tapes of I think I have the the last Atlanta Flames hockey game ever, right? Things right, like that, right. you know. And people would trade, right. and somebody would be like, "Hey, just make a copy. Mm-hmm. Let's trade it." You know, and people weren't even trying yep. to make money off of it. It was just people no. that were like, "Hey, we always see highlights. We never see full games." And mm-hmm. so, if mm-hmm. you can watch the whole game, that's fantastic, right? And so, I have a few thousand of those on external drives. Oh, that's insane! That, that's great. Yeah, yeah, and. And I'm trying to sort of sort through them now, and it's hard to hit that delete button, but I'm trying to really think about it. Like, is this something I'm going to watch again, or is it really not? Because I don't necessarily want to just save them all to just have the games. I'm not I'm not as much into watching old games as I used to be, although I do still enjoy it. But, but that hobby has kind of um, passed me by a little bit in lieu of of the publishing and the gaming and all of that so i and the writing actually i do a lot of that now as well okay we'll get into that one set one one last question before we get into the magazine i know we're, we're having some fun here talking some stuff but we do yeah, want yeah. to talk about your magazine uh Absolutely. when you brought up the basketball project one thing that came to my mind now again i'm fairly new with the sports sim community okay i'm, I'm a new guy here you know six months eight months a year whatever it is when you brought up the basketball project, do, do you feel – this is just your opinion now. Do you feel when it comes to the sports sims, you know, some of the cards and dice stuff or whether it's the PC port to the games, that baseball is king and then maybe foot, uh, maybe hockey, then football, then basketball? It seems like basketball is kind of – and I know some people mm-hmm. are going to get upset at this, but it seems like, you know, baseball, there's a million baseball games. And then it seems like hockey is the second one, and then football maybe tied with hockey, and then you get basketball. Is that how you feel? Um, I would feel that way exactly, yes. And, I mean, it's pretty hard to deny that you actually do have a pretty big, not just even baseball, but stratomatic baseball community across the world. And that's still really the godfather, and that's still really the behemoth of of the community is the stratomatic game company and um i think baseball is by far probably the most popular sport that's played out there followed by the other three which i call them you know the 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 other three really big american sports but someone someone did tell me recently that the the game that is most popular around the world, even in this community, is still soccer. Um, that it sells the most copies of any game, and I can't remember which version of soccer it was, but uh, he told me that it was indeed a soccer game, sells more than Strat does around the world, but absolutely not in the U.S. But I I I really start to think that's um. Actually, starting to change. I really think baseball, as as far as gamers are concerned, is starting to lose its hold a little bit, as we're all kind of expanding outward. Like 
I'm interested now in finding, you know, really good tennis games and boxing games and golf games and, and, um, sort of expanding outward. And I think a lot of other people are as well. So I think that's starting to change a little bit. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about the magazine here. Uh, Sports Sim Magazine, it is called. And let me ask you here. We're in 2019 right now. Why a magazine and why sports simulations? (laughs) Two excellent questions, actually. Uh, To answer the first, it's, it's really just as easy as the fact I love magazines. And I love to be able to sit down in a chair, open up a magazine, thumb through the pages, not have to scroll a screen, not have to use a mouse. Um, I really like the idea of magazines. I love their covers, front and back. I love to sort of uh, be able to have my hand on page five and also have a hand on page 83 and go back and forth and compare some things. I really think it's a medium that's valuable, but I also think it stands the test of time in that people can put them on a bookshelf and keep them as opposed to just a random file on the computer that, uh, that may crash at some point or maybe gone at some point, or they may not be able to find at some point. So I really do think it's it's a more stable medium, even if not a more popular medium right now, which is also why we we offer the PDF ebook as well as the actual print magazine. I I, I, I like that. Yeah, I like what you said there, because this times that, you know, I, I like the convenience. I mean, we talk options. OK, I like the convenience mm-hmm. of, you know, pulling out my iPad and ordering a book and then reading it in 15 seconds. That is really kind of cool. But at the same time. I find I read more if I have the physical book in my hand, okay? Right. And uh, maybe that's just me. I don't know what it is. But, I mean, I like the idea that if I want to order a book instantly, I can. In, in, or, or your PDF, for example. If I want to get your magazine, I can order it, and I can be reading it in seconds on my iPad. That's pretty mm-hmm. good. But at the same time, sometimes I do like to have that in my hand. And I personally tend to read more if, if the book's in my hand. That That's just mm-hmm. me, you know, um, but again, you do have to wait for the physical copy. That's that's the trade off. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And right now with ours, you have to wait about about a week and a half for it to show up because it is on demand publishing. So they do have to print the magazine out first. Uh but I think it's worth it. I really do. And I thought that it it was a good topic for a magazine. One, because I've been into it since I was a young elementary kid. And Um, what happened to me and I'll, I'll just kind of go through my story here for you real quick. Um, when I was young, I had an uncle in Chicago who actually showed me a dice baseball game that he had just kind of made up over the years. It just, I think we just use one die. Actually, it was completely random. It, it, it was based upon nobody having any skills, nobody having any attributes, it was just completely a random game, but I must have been about eight years old. But, and he was also in, in a rotisserie league, which is sort of uh, like f- fantasy gaming, but yet back at that time, back in the early 80s, especially, it was quite popular. Um, and he asked me about a trade one day, and I don't know why I remember this, but he asked me if he should trade Paul Householder for Jose de Leon. And and I said, I don't know. I must have been eight, eight, eight to ten years old. And but I can remember being fascinated that he would be able to make that decision. I was like, wow, he can trade Paul Householder for Jose de Leon. That's incredible. I said, what would happen if if I could trade a Reggie Jackson or a Ryan Sandberg or a Nolan Ryan or have them on my team. I said, that's incredible. So I was really intrigued and I saw the possibilities right away. So I, I have a really good pack of tight compadres that I've had from elementary school on. And we all pretty much 
scored really well in school. We all went to college. We all have careers now. And we knew early on, we were all sports fanatics as well. And we figured out that sports was math. Well, we were, we were also uh, into Dungeons and Dragons at the time when we were about 10 to 12. And so we had all those dice. And knowing math really well and then having those dice, we said, well, you know, if Michael Jordan hits 52 percent of his shots, you could use these two 10 sided dice and say, well, everything from 49 up to zero, zero is a made shot. Everything below 49 is a missed shot. And so it really started there. And we really started to make up our own games. We obviously were poor kids. We're from a small rural town in Illinois. Uh, You know, the nearest toy store was well over a half an hour away. And and they might have the strat game for that year, but they probably don't. So we had no idea as kids that there were other games out there. So we made up our own. And we figured out how to find statistics and would buy an almanac every year because back at that time, that was the easiest way to get statistics or the sporting news, which was not always up to date in their statistics. They were always a week or two behind. And so we figured out how mathematics and sports sort of go hand in hand. And we started to figure out how we would play these games in a very rudimentary way. And... I mean, looking back on it now, it was very basic. It was, is he going to complete the pass? Is he going to make the shot? Is he going to get a hit? You know, we really didn't understand, you know, how to do a passing rating or how to do a blocking rating in football. And so what we did was we just sort of made up our own games. And we, I mean, we made up games for everything, for boxing, for archery, for golf, for every single sport that we could find anything for in the almanac. We made up uh, some kind of a game for it. So, And then we got into a, a computer game called Micro League Baseball, and it was excellent for its time. And then we actually found Hafner Games, And I would say that we have spent more time in Hafner games, in all of them, in all the Hafner games, than we spent doing anything else. And we've sort of found our way into Strat because we're spread out all over the country now and we can play each other online relatively easily with Strat. And it allows for that. So, but we really found our way in Hafner games, which for its time also, for being, you know, the early to mid to late 90s, Hafner games was fantastic on computer. And this, you know, when I got into publishing, I... Yeah, I, I did want to ask you that. What, what is your yes, background yes. with publishing and writing and the whole bit that, that you're bringing to the magazine? Well, I went to Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and my first major actually was in journalism. I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to write history and politics and because I'm very interested, very fascinated, and very much into history and politics as well. And so I went into journalism, and my last semester I decided – that I didn't really want to spend 10 years writing about, you know, the Elks Lodge meeting uptown or how the firemen save the cat in the tree. So I decided to go ahead and graduate with my BA in journalism. So you, you then, don't you don't like cats? Is that what you're saying? You don't like cats? <laughs> no, I, no, I love the felines. Um, but I am uh, – n- n- I would rather write about what's happening in, you know, n- in – North Africa or East Asia or Washington than that. And so um, I stayed in to teach it, actually. And so I then in about two years also had my BS in education and had a minor in poli sci. So um, I taught high school history for 10 years and got out of it to write full time. And so I'm hosting a history podcast show. I'm also doing a history magazine, which which really serves to sort of challenge the historical establishment. Um, I wouldn't call it conspiracy theory because I hate that expression, 
but it, it it is absolutely a a magazine and a show and the writing that I do really serves to sort of challenge the establishment which in sports gaming to be honest with you what all of us are really doing is challenging the establishment in a sense that we are taking a league th- the way it was actually ran and saying you know what I don't think it needed to be ran that way. <laughs> Why don't we make up our own league and make up our own teams and decide, and we're going to change a few rules and we're going to do this. So it is still a, a, a slightly rebellious hobby in a sense that we want to sort of control our own sports rather than having our sports controlled for us. So it still does that. It still feeds that need. But so I've been a writer and a publisher now uh, for a while after I got out of education and I just decided, you know what, I, I want to take all of the hobbies that that I have and I want to give something back to the communities that I have enjoyed my entire life. And I didn't know if this would work or not. I really didn't. But I knew that there was a community out there, obviously. And I knew that there were a lot of people like me, which as a kid, you don't really know uh, unless you, you, your pals also play these games too. You really do grow up not knowing if there's anybody like you out there (laughs) who's enjoying these hobbies the way that you are. So luckily I found some really good writers in the first issue and You know, it is a first issue. It's only 80 pages. Ideally, starting with issue two, I would like to go up to around 120 pages. I would like it to be longer and I would like it to be more deep. But I wanted to show everyone, okay, here's kind of a template of what we can do. Now, we kind of need everybody on board. We kind of need everybody to sort of like it. And then we can really, really show you what can be done. So that's the point we're at now. Okay, and we are again joined by St. Patrick. He is the editor in chief of the brand new Sports Sim Magazine. And let me ask you this: Why now? Why not? Why not a year ago? Why not in a year? Why now? Well, that's just all. Uh, actually, it's a technical answer. Um, I started to subscribe to the entire Adobe Suite about a year to a year and a half ago. And I finally gotten to a point on InDesign where I can publish magazines in a pretty timely manner. And I've gotten pretty adept at InDesign. And to publish these, you have to be able to do it in a certain amount of time. And you have to sort of know what you're doing. And to be honest with you, technically, I've just gotten to that point. Well, oh, fantastic. Okay, now let's dig in to the Sports Sim Magazine. Okay, issue yes. one is out. Uh, what is in issue one? If if, if someone were to get this magazine, what, what's in there? Says, talk about that. Well, I kind of opened with the story uh, with a more detailed explanation of the story that I just uh, told you about my childhood and being in into gaming because I really thought that was a good way to open the magazine. And then I also sort of explained the dice in case anyone out there is new. Um One of the things that I wanted was I wanted a father to be able to buy this magazine or I wanted a mom to be able to buy this magazine. And I wanted the son or daughter to be able to pick it up if they know nothing about gaming. They might be eight years old. They might be 10 and read the first issue and kind of understand it. So I also explained the dice as well. Um, We have three articles by gamers who sort of discuss their own history in gaming as well. We have uh, five articles on on replays. Most of them are, are baseball-oriented. One is about myself and the Oakland A's trying to save a very bad A's team, which unfortunately could not be saved. Um, so uh, we have five articles on replays. We have two articles by G.W. Brown and Ron Pizarz discussing games that they created. One is a boxing game. One is a f- f- football game. Um, I have a, a guy named Dale Weiser. He, he does an excellent job. What he does is that he makes Stratomatic college basketball cards they're 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 not made by stratomatic stratomatic they're made by dale but because strat has no college basketball game he makes his own cards 
for his own use. So he gave us four teams that he's made, which I think are excellent. And, and those are in there as well. I put some statistical pages in there. I don't know if you saw these or not yet, but I put the Vanderbilt Commodores baseball team in there. Um, we some three point shot statistics, some NFL statistics, some golf statistics and rankings. And I put in a couple pages of statistics that are actually hard to find college baseball statistics from some of the all time great college baseball stars from the last 30 or so years in case anybody wanted to input those into a game. And I kind of like the idea because it seems like sports gamers are also, you know, stat guys as well. Obviously all of us are. And so I like having five to 10 pages of statistics in the magazine that you can just sort of input or toy with, or that could help you in a draft league or can help you in some kind of way. And <laughs> what I actually debated doing, and I, I decided to go ahead with it, was I put, I think, five brackets in the magazine as well. Because a lot of people, especially basketball uh, guys out there, love to run tournaments. And so I, I've done a wide variety of brackets in my days that we just sort of horsed around with at home. And I mean, bizarre ones and, you know, ladder tournaments and elimination tournaments and all kinds. So I have about five brackets in there as well that any gamer would be able to use, but especially basketball. And then the last part of the magazine are games. They're very basic games. We have a golf game, we have a stock car racing game, and we have an archery game in the magazine. And they're very fast. They're very easy to learn. Again, with the thought behind it of if it's a father buying the magazine and he's got an eight-year-old kid, a 10-year-old kid, they could easily start these games right when they open the magazine and not have 20 pages of instructions and not have to know you know, every all star in the field and not have to. So now where did these, where where did these, game, where did these games come from? Um, I made up these games. Okay. Uh, part, part of them come from my childhood. Uh, they're sort of extensions of, of games that we already have. Um, and part of them I, I've made up in the past year, you know, and, and again, sports is all math. As long as you have the statistics, you can kind of, figure how how a sport works and sort of make up games for that sport. So I would like to ex- expand that actually in the future. I would yeah, like that to, was my next question. And so you're yeah. talking about you want to you, know, you want to expand on you want to make the magazine larger. You want uh, more pages. So we talked about what's in issue one. What will be in upcoming issues and what are some of your ideas for issues going forward? A couple changes I would like to see. I would like to see the replay articles become longer um, and more detailed because I I know that there are so many places online, uh, you know, tabletop sports and, you know, the Delphi forums and all these things where you can read replays and you can read updates to everyone's replays. And I don't want the magazine to be just a print version of going on a board online. I, I want it to be an alternative to that. So I think a way to make it an alternative is to, if we're going to print replays, and I think we should, I think the way to do that is to make sure that they're very detailed and we really do get into the thought process behind the replay as well. I want to know why a certain person decided to replay that year, that team. What is it that really drew them to starting that project. And I would like to get more articles by the guys and gals who created all these games. ST, what what has been the reception of issue one? I think it's been overwhelmingly positive, actually. We have um, sold enough now to, to really go ahead with issue two um, and to make it you know, worth the time and the effort and paying to actually do it. Um, I didn't know if we would s- s- sell three copies or 3,000. So, I mean, I had no, you, you just don't know until you do it. 
So I didn't really have an idea of that. Um, so we are moving full steam ahead on issue two at this point, but it, it's been overwhelmingly positive and I've had a lot of people um, ask to take part in the production of the magazine, which has been just incredibly kind. And so we're going to absolutely take them up on that. Okay. And let's see, uh, what, what suggestions have you had going forward from the community on uh, issue number two? I think everyone else also wanted longer replay articles, wanted more uh, statistics in their replay articles, wanted to know the thought process behind them, especially. Um, and they wanted to make sure that it wasn't a print version of what they could already read for free online. That was the major concern before we even released the magazine was, am I just going to be paying for something that I can already read online? And my answer there is no. My answer there is, you know, we've tried to make it with, with all the parts of the magazine, with a wide variety of things in the magazine, we've tried to make it where it is absolutely content that you're not going to get online, but that it's also interesting to be in a chair and just go through the magazine. All right, let's talk about now where we can find this magazine. Okay, so I'm looking here. We'll put this link in the, the show notes as well, but uh, you're using a service called lulu.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is an on-demand publisher. And if they want to go to lulu.com, the cool thing about them that I've found so far is they run a lot of 10% off uh deals usually every week. So on their front page, lulu.com, you can uh, see the codes for getting 10% off. You can see that quite often. I don't know if there's one going right now, but, and then you can just do a search there for sports sim magazine, or you can go to the actual site, which will be lulu.com slash spotlight slash M W N publications. But I think the easiest way is to just go into the show notes here and hit the link or to go to lulu.com and just do a search for Sports Sim Magazine. Okay, yeah. So lulu.com slash spotlight slash MWN publications. And that will bring you right, right to the Sports Sim Magazine issue one. And you can buy the ebook or you can buy the paperback versions of that. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So once again, uh, we've been talking with St. Patrick. He's the editor in chief of the Sports Sim Magazine. I want to thank you so much for being on the Digital to Dice podcast. Hey, thank you very much, Dave, and thank you, Ron. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to the Digital to Dice podcast, episode twelve. We talked with St. Patrick of the Sports Sim Magazine. And ways to get a hold of us, digitaltodice.com. That is our website. On Facebook, head over to facebook.com slash groups slash digital to dice. Join the conversation there. And also the voice and text line, 978-751-DICE, 978-751-3423. Hope you enjoyed episode 12. We look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Dave. Bye-bye.